curve, and you basically want to smoke every cigarette for which B minus beta C is greater than the, uh, sorry, where, yeah, B minus beta C is greater than the price, okay, right? So that's where I'm getting this demand curve, and I'm calling it the behavioral demand curve, and what you can, what you can do is you can say, well, that's the actual observed, right? We call it the behavioral demand curve in the sense that, oh, this is the behavioral economic dumb-dumb irrational demand curve, but it's also the behavioral demand curve in the sense that that's people's actual behavior. That's what they'll actually do. And then this is the demand curve uh, that you would get if people were rational and their utility for smoking was instead B minus C, right? So it's going to be lower because C is bigger than beta C. Okay. Question for you, which you're probably all about halfway answering is, what's the dead weight loss caused by the internality? Okay, five, four, three, two, one, stop. All right, what should the answer is? Someone who is certain that they got the right answer want to walk us through the steps of how they got there. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That would be here. So this is the socially optimal quantity. Okay, so this is how many cigarettes you ought to smoke. According to your own preferences, we say. Okay, fine, good. Okay, so would you be willing to let me call that Q market? Okay. Suboptimal. <laughs> Why do you care about the supply curve? Because we're assuming away externalities in production. That's the marginal social cost curve. <laughs> Takes a village, doesn't it? This is why we work in teams. Um, so. That's the cost of society for every cigarette smoked, right? That's, that is the cost of digging the tobacco up out of the ground. True. Okay, and what's the benefit of society? The benefit of society being the rational Okay, distance between the two for the suboptimal units is that is the that is the dead weight loss, C. You guys ready for the big reveal? It's a boy. Okay, good work. The majority went with C. Now, there's a really, really important lesson here, right? Which is that if you just follow my steps, you'll get the answer, even if you were wrong in the first place, right? So you, you knew the steps, you walked through them, we got to the answer. Good. All right. Um, what do I want to say about this? Now we can come back and we around and we can say, what is that? What, what is that? What, in terms of sort of telling the Crosstown Taxi story, what's going on here? Okay. Where's the, where is the uh, internal, where is the total internal harm to the smoker? What is the total harm that the smoker is causing themselves for smoking cigarettes that they shouldn't order? It's three plus four, right? This is, this, is the, um, this is the marginal internal cost over the full range of cigarettes that they should not have smoked. Okay? So that's the total, that's the total harm uh, that they're causing themselves over and above the actual benefit they got out of the cigarettes. I, mean, I don't, don't want to be sort of paternalistic and, 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 and um, uh, self-righteous. There's benefits to smoking. It feels good. I have, in fact, smoked. Um, and I stopped really quickly because I saw where things were going. Um, uh, because it's, you know, it's a blast. It feels great. Um, but that's the, that's, the, that's the harm they're causing themselves over and above the cost, the, oh, the benefit that they're getting because they don't fully appreciate the long-term costs. Fine. That's not all a harm to society, right? The only part that's a harm to society is this, because what we actually care about when we define deadweight loss, it's the difference when we define social surplus, which could be negative in which case it's deadweight loss, is it's the difference between the actual benefit society got out of the good and the actual cost of society. This line here, right, this behavioral demand curve, doesn't represent any kind of value to society. What it represents is the decision-making rule of the smoker. But it's not based on actual utility. It's not an actual benefit to society. The actual benefit to society is here. Okay? So we don't actually have a sort of conceptual, um, I don't, haven't come up with a good, clean, intuitive, conceptual explanation of what three is and why we don't consider three to be a benefit to society from a tax. Um, because it isn't, it's not actually ever, it doesn't ever represent benefit to the consumer that we're taking away. Not, there's, no, there's no sort of intuitive um, interpretation of what three is. Um, but what we do know is that there's, there's basically this chunk of lost consumer surplus because consumers are paying for cigarettes that they shouldn't. They're paying more for these cigarettes than they get out of them in the long run. Okay? Good? Yeah? No, not so good. Question. So the cost of society is the is the different is is right. So we say something's good for society if the benefit that the consumer got out of it was greater than the cost of society of producing it. The cost of society of producing the cigarettes is the height of the supply curve. These suboptimal cigarettes are ones for which the benefit to the consumer was less than the cost of producing the cigarettes. Okay. The reason that they smoke them is because their actual decision-making rule wasn't based on their on their true benefits and costs. It was based on a, an irrational, irrationally discounted version of benefits and costs. And you know, if you want, if you, if, you know, if you want some confirmation of my claim that a lot of times people, if, after the fact, will thank you for correcting their preferences, there's a whole lot of smokers that would love to have been whacked with a ten dollar and fifty cent per pack tax a long time ago and would have thank you for it. Okay, fine. All right. So now I want to do some actual normative analysis, uh, a la Pareto and Hicks Calder. So what is the Pareto uh, efficiency rule? Something is Pareto efficient if you can't make one person better off without making other, the other one or some other one worse off. Okay. Which is to say um, that a policy is only a Pareto improvement if there are no costs. Okay. Um, so any way you can come up, anytime you can come up with a public policy that makes everyone better off, that's great. Hicks Calder just says that something is an improvement if it makes the sum of uh, benefits and costs bigger. Okay. So here's a situation where I've drawn the internality quite large. Okay. Um, right. So this is the total benefit of the most beneficial cigarette, and I'm saying that the internal cost, the one minus beta times c, is like almost half of that. Okay. So it's huge. Um, this is a situation where, right. So we we have these are the suboptimal units. If we stick a tax in here, a tax that is equal to one minus beta times c, we'll get people. We'll get the market to the optimal, uh, the sort of rational number of cigarettes. We will have eliminated this much dead weight loss. Okay. Uh, call that b, and we will have generated this much tax revenue. Okay. Does everybody get why that rectangle is tax revenue? Um, 
Now, notice that the smoker, unlike in the case of the externality, the smoker is experiencing both of these things. So for this to be a Pareto improvement, it needs to be the case uh, that B is greater than A. So we've helped the smoker by B. We've harmed them by taking away tax dollars. If that is greater than zero, if the, if the reduction in internal harm or the deadweight loss caused by the internal harm is greater than the tax revenue that we extract from this person, then that person will be made better off and they'll thank us. Okay? Uh, and, and then, of course, you know, taxpayers are made better off because they, they generate you know, A as a benefit to taxpayers. Now, in terms of Hicks Calder efficiency, the, the tax revenue is a wash, right? In terms of just what's, what are we doing to the sum of social, the to, you know, total net benefit to society, we're taking tax revenue away from smokers and we're giving it to taxpayers. That's a wash in terms of society. We don't, that's that's um, a one for one trade from, between smokers and taxpayers. And in terms of Hicks Calder efficiency or the effect on total social surplus or net benefit, what we've done is we've added B. So this is for sure a Hicks Calder improvement. But it's only a Pareto improvement if the tax revenue that we raise is, small, rel is smaller than the uh, deadweight loss from the internal harm that we generate. Okay? And that'll be the case if the internality is really huge because then the tax will drive an enormous amount of, actually, sorry. It doesn't just depend upon the size of the internality, it also depends upon the slope of the demand curve. But there will be conditions under which, and should be predictable if you can measure the slope of the demand curve, under which the tax will make the smokers better off even net of the taxes that they have to pay. Okay? Um, so that would be a Pareto improvement, though again, the naive might not think so. Um, it would depend on, uh, on whether or not they eventually wised up to the irrationality of their smoking behavior. If the internality is smaller, okay, then we'll wind up in a situation where we're reducing deadweight loss from the internality uh, by less and imposing a much larger tax burden on the smoker, in which case the smoker may say, hey, you know what? Uh, you can take your uh, paternalistic tax and uh, blow it out your vape pen. Um, okay, so that's just, uh, that's just, um, so this would still be Hicks Calder, but the, uh, it's not clear whether it's good public policy to say, oh, I'm going to tax away your internality, but I'm then going to walk away with the tax money, right? This is uh, not so obvious that we're making people better off. Um, we might be making society as a whole better off. In the case of an externality, this is perfectly justifiable, right? Yes, I'm taxing the drivers of SUVs, and yes, that's a harm to them, but they're causing a harm to somebody else, right? And I'm the tax is offsetting that harm. So it's not so hard to see or to defend that that's better for society, even though it's hurting the SUV driver. Here, it's really unclear whether we should stand on that because we're hurting the same person we're trying to help. The tax revenue is hurting is a cost borne by the exact same person we're trying to help. Um, now, to come back to Timothy's comment about subsidizing scooters. By the way, if you have a policy to subsidize scooters, I'm all for it. Um, so can anybody think of a way that we could turn this into uh, an actual Pareto improvement, a policy that would make this a com just a, a, a complete gain for smokers? Ah, the graphic warning labels, right, because then you're, right, okay. Yeah, I mean, ban, ban smoking would be another one, right? Um, but just going with the tax. Okay, so I'm a smoker. I smoke three packs a day. You charge me ten fifty per pack. That's $3. And did I say three packs a day? Three packs a day. So you're, you're taxing me, what did we say? You're taxing me now thirty one fifty a day. How much are you going to give me back? So if you give me back thirty one fifty, that's not going to help much, right? What? I'd probably catch on that that's not actually, the actual tax rate is zero, right? So what, what you would do, and this, is, this was the, this was the, um, so Jimmy Carter was president back in the 70s, which is a time when clever economists were just starting to gain power in the American government. Um, and, and the idea people had was, let's ration gasoline, because this was in the days of the, uh, this was um, the time of the Iran, you know, when the Iranian revolution, and we had this huge spike in gas prices and we needed to ration. And so the idea was, let's tax people at the pump, then let's give them the money back, but we'll just give it back to them on everybody gets the same amount basis. We'll just take it and divvy up by the number of drivers. Okay? So you could do this with the smokers if you want. Um, I think you could probably argue that the graphic warning labels is a more straightforward way to do this, because then you have to figure everyone would go out and start smoking so they could get a chunk of that money. Interesting. Interesting. So again, harnessing the power of people's irrationality in order to help them overcome their irrationality. We can talk more about that in a couple of days. Um, okay, there was, a, there was a hand here. No? Okay, yeah. Um, we're doing that for other, like, other taxes, like carbon taxes, and diesel taxes. Sure. So uh, they have the tax to help that, and then it's just a random yeah. tax out. Right. You just need to make sure that the basis on which you return the money is that the basis that the formula you use to return the money does not include the thing that you're trying to change, the behavior that you're trying to change. Okay. Um, so I wanted to talk about da -da -da -da, Hicks Calder. I'm going to come back to that later, I think. Let's do this. This is the last page of your handout. So let's just go with the assumption that the long-term cost of smoking is $35 per pack, and the beta is 0.7. Okay? Sorry, let's, I'm not saying let's go with the assumption. Under that assumption, which is the assumption that, um, so if you go and read, I, I posted, I haven't actually uploaded it. I'm going to upload to vSpace the, um, the actual benefit cost analysis that the FDA did on this graphic warning label um, policy. And what they did was they said, look, there's all these long-term health benefits, but we're also taking away consumer surplus from people because we're taking away the pleasure of smoking, and we're going to offset that by saying, look, the only part of the long-term health benefit that we're actually adding to people, that we're giving back to people, isn't really C, it's 1 minus beta times C. So they took the long-term health benefit, which they computed, and multiplied it by 0.3. And they said, we're really only benefiting people by 0.3 of this because that's 1 minus beta times C. So they actually took this estimate of beta as 0.7, literally, and said, Psh, the model says 1 minus beta times C. That's the appropriate way of evaluating the benefit that we've done to people by helping them stop smoking with these graphic warning labels. Question to you, knowing what you know about the kinds of studies that we use for estimating beta, right? So you've seen all these things, how much money in two weeks versus four weeks, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the food stamps, right? So food now versus money uh, later or food later. Um, based on what you know about where we come up with our estimates of beta, do you think that the optimal tax should be higher, lower, or equal to 1050 a pack? In other words, do you think that perhaps the conclusion that the FDA made is you know, high, lower, or, or, or spot on? Okay. Five, four, three, two, one. All right. All right. So we have some saying higher, some saying lower. Um, who, who said higher wants to justify a higher answer that we haven't heard from? Someone who's higher in the classroom? Hopefully not higher in other ways. Your name is Rebecca, right? Did you say A? You said A. Let's go with you said A. You said C. Okay, so w tell me why you said C. Okay, so you're just saying, look, the, the numbers are there. I trust the model. I'm going to go with it. It's, that's the right answer, okay? 
That's fine. Um, uh, you can reconsider your answer later. Um, other thoughts? Who said higher? Who said it should be higher? And why? Yeah. Okay, so money, we have money, most of the beta is money now versus money later. We have food stamps, which is food now versus food later. Do you remember the estimate of beta that we got from the food stamp study? It was high. It was like 0.96, okay? So apparently, the degree to which people appear to discount the future is what we call domain-specific. So in the domain of food, when you're really close to the poverty line, people seem to have, take into account, take the future into account way more than in, say, the desire for heroin. And so, your, sorry, remind me of your name? Connor. Connor. So Connor's idea is, that's the wrong beta for this situation, okay? I tend to agree with that. And it brings me back to one of my biggest sort of, um, one of the places where I feel like behavioral economics has not yet quite hit the nail on the head, um, we went from a delta model to, a, I think you'll all agree, radically improved beta delta model. Adding beta explains so many things. But if you recall what I said at the very beginning of all of this, beta is capturing, still capturing a lot of complicated psychology. Right? So there's a the whole future time perspective. I don't think about the future. I don't wear sunblock because I just can't stand the way it makes my hands greasy. I'm probably going to die of skin cancer. I already have precancerous cells on my lower lip because I sailed, raced, raced sailboats for so long without wearing sunblock on my lips. But that's going to happen in the future. This is not about temptation. Greasy hands is not a temptation issue. I just don't care about the future because I don't think about it. Okay? Smoking is a matter of temptation. You could be staring your future self in the face. You could be sitting, you could, you could, you could be visiting your great aunt who's dying of lung cancer and smoking right in her bedroom. The point is that it's just incredibly hard to overcome the temptation. Okay? It's harder to overcome the temptation to smoke than it is to overcome the temptation to eat cake for most people. Um, and so the, what I think is going on there, the temptation itself, the degree of temptation, that's in what Matt Raven calls the little use, right? So the immediate utility of a cigarette, uh, it may be way more tempting than the immediate utility of cake. The issue isn't how tempting it is. The issue is how much willpower are you able to bring to bear? Now, people who've smoked or attempted to stop smoking, am I right that there's kind of a, is Connor right that there's kind of a mismatch between the degree of temptation and the degree of willpower? People who've tried to stop smoking and failed have probably done a large number of other things that involve huge amounts of willpower, right? The problem isn't lack of willpower. There's something much more going on with smoking that makes the Kasegi Gruber estimate using beta equal 0.7 completely inappropriate for public policy analysis. The lesson is the same here as throughout the semester, which is if you don't have the right model, you're not going to make the right policy recommendations, okay? Thank you.